Unlike the many talented storytellers here this evening, I can't tell a tale unless it's written down, so excuse me. But actually, until very recently, I wouldn't have called myself much of a storyteller at all, out of respect for the term. I guess I felt a storyteller is someone with a generative, unlimited imagination, the kind of person who makes worlds, someone like Roald Dahl or Ursula Le Guin. Like imagine an everlasting gobstopper or a planet in which gender is not a fixed state but a condition changing season by season. Now, those are stories. And my own writing seemed to me more prosaic. I don't make up marvelous stories. I only try to express as clearly as possible the feelings and thoughts most people have. Often my subjects are the simplest things in the world, joy, family, the weather, houses, streets, nothing fancy. And when I sit down with these subjects, my aim is clarity. First and foremost, I want to clear some of the muddle from my own brain, my brain being a very muddled place indeed. And sometimes I think my whole professional life has been based on a hunch I had early on that a lot of people feel as muddled as I do and might be happy to tag along with me on the search for clarity and for precision. And I love that aspect of writing. Nothing makes me happier than to hear a reader say, that's just what I've always felt, but you said it clearly. I feel that I've achieved something useful when that happens. But that has often seemed quite far away from real storytelling. And in truth, there have been times over the past decade where I felt quite distant from stories and unsure how to tell them. I guess I forgot, as rappers like to say, why I got into this game in the first place. And then I had kids. Christ, what a boring story, then I had kids. But I have to be truthful, and the truth is something happened when I had kids. I went from not being able to really think of a single story to being unable to stop seeing stories pretty much every place I looked. But before anybody raises a hand to object, I, I'm not a biological essentialist or one of those people who believes the gift for empathy arrives along with the placenta, that's not me. But the explanation, in my opinion, is less dramatic, storybooks. Because for the first time since childhood, I'm back in the realm of stories and storybooks. I have to read three out loud to a four-year-old every night on pain of death, literally. And this practice has reawakened in me something I honestly thought I'd misplaced a long time ago, on book tour perhaps, or in the back row of a university lecture hall. This feeling of narrative possibility and wonder, this idea, as we've seen this evening, that every person is a world. How could I have forgotten that? Did I really almost drift away down that anemic intellectual path where storytelling is considered vulgar and characters are stain on the purity of a sentence? Dear Lord, almost. So I'm so grateful to get reacquainted with, say, George's Marvelous Medicine. You remember that? To read all about the mouth on George's grandma, which, if you've forgotten, is puckered like a dog's bottom. When I read things like that, it sends me back to my desk with an ease and fluidity I haven't felt since my own childhood. Which is all to say, this lovely award comes at the right moment, just when I find myself falling back in love with stories and appreciating anew what an unprecedented privilege it is to make your living telling them. And one of the most wonderful and unlikely stories of my life is the one about the girl from Wilsdon who found readers in the United States. And not a little of the credit for that is due to my good friend Kimberly Burns, who's somewhere in the back, who was my, my first publicist. Um, I want to thank her, thank you. And also thank everyone at The Moth so much for giving me an opportunity to say thank you to some of my American readers tonight for their unexpected generosity and for the gift of your attention and time. Um, before I leave the stage, I want to tell a short story uh, concerning my first conscious experience of storytelling. And I think when you hear it, you might better understand the root of some of my conflicted feelings about the form. Here goes. Oh. Once upon a time, I was nine. It was summer in England, the sky was blue, it was also full of clouds. I was not, how can I put this, at the time, overburdened with friends. <laughs> it was warm, 
but school was still in session and this presented an insolvable problem, the recess problem, for there's only so long you can walk a playground pretending to be looking for people who know you. And to hide my isolation, I spent a lot of time looking at the clouds and at a strange ivory-covered tower that stood next door to our school. In the attic of that building, I decided, a tragic young woman lived. She was the prisoner of a god who did not want, to marry, want her to marry her true love, who was Superman. Didn't make sense, but it was a story, and I got good at telling it. And in order to draw attention to myself, I started telling it to kids in the playground. It got more elaborate each time I told it, and I always finished up by swearing on my mother's life that it was true. I swear, I swear there's a young woman up there, and she's sending smoke signals into the sky in the shape of clouds. So when you see one that looks like Superman, put a tack in your shoe. The more people with tacks in their shoe, the louder it'll sound when you walk, and the louder it sounds when you walk, the... To be honest, I don't really remember. There must have been a logic to this story, but I can't recall now what it was. Anyway, the takeaway was tack in your shoe. I was hell-bent on this tack in your shoe business. You've got to put a tack in your shoe or this poor girl will die. I swear on my mother's life. It's actually a miracle my mother survived that summer. Well, people seemed to be into this story. Everybody was into it, except for this one girl. Her name was Anutma, who proved to be a skeptic. She was very smart, Anutma. This was part of the problem. She was not moved by rhetoric. She had a fundamental logical issue with the smoke signals, cloud, superman, trifecta. She wasn't having it. And one day, appropriate of nothing at all, she turned to me in the playing fields and said, that story isn't true. It's a lie. And I'm going to tell everyone. And she started to run towards her classroom. And watching her go, I experienced a 10-year-old version of acute despair. Everything I'd built, all my new friends, indeed, a sense of my own value, all of it seemed dependent on this ridiculous story. And she was threatening to reveal it for what it was, a lie. I had to stop her from reaching that classroom, so I ran after her. She was fast, it wasn't easy. But just by the sandpit, I put my leg in front of hers like an Italian footballer, and I dragged her violently to the ground, where her knee promptly split open. And I remember she was bleeding and crying, <laughs> defeated on the floor, and the look she gave me at that moment, I've never forgotten. It was a kind of horrified question. What kind of a person is this? <laughs> well, the nurse came. And Nutma was taken to the medical room, patched up. As far as I know, she didn't rat on me. At least I was allowed to pass unmolested to my class. And I caught up with the other kids in the hall. What is that noise? Asked the teacher as we shuffled into class. Tap, tap, tap. It took me a second to recognize it myself. A tax in every shoe. Uh, tonight, my husband is here. And he's heard that story many times. He actually has his head in his hands right now. Um, <laughs> Having known each other 20 years, there isn't a story of mine he hasn't heard many times, and vice versa. And he rolls his eyes at that story in particular because of the mix of humble brag and pure ruthlessness it displays. Um, but he's a storyteller too, and I think he knows what I mean by telling it. Um, storytelling is a magical, ruthless discipline. And the people who tell stories are often tempted to create a kind of hierarchy in their lives in which stories become, come before everything else, including people. And part of my anxiety about storytelling is an awareness of that monomaniacal part of me that's willing to wrestle a little girl to the ground in order to preserve the integrity of a story. <laughs> I know that part of me exists, but I really try to suppress it because I want to find an accommodation between telling stories about life and living it well. In this accommodation, no one and no story can compare to my husband, who is very, every bit as ruthlessly dedicated to writing as I am but who has, besides, a capacity for love and kindness that I know I'll spend my lifetime trying to equal. Uh, without you, I would not be telling stories at all. I'd just be kicking little girls in the face. <laughs> so <laughs> the luckiest thing that's happened to me, besides becoming a professional storyteller, is marrying one. I don't often get a chance to say it publicly, so I wanted to. Thank you, Nick, and thank you all. Sadie Smith, ladies and gentlemen.